before you ask, yes. It is because of Sephiroth going into Smash Bros. He is a psychopath. He is a murderous, bad, chonky bad boy. Can't be woke all the time. There are hours at which we sleep. I guess I could also blame this on the holidays. I can go, Santa. Santa's like big titty niece. Hello, it's Ken here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up home skillet biscuit? And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a beat series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. But this is the last bad movies and a beat for this year. This will probably be my last video for the year as well. Uh, so, and considering this is the last video of the year, we should do something exciting, special for the kids. Not for the kids, fucking kids. <laughs> a gift for the masses. We're not just doing a shitty Christmas movie, because I've done that before. Have I? We're not just talking about a crappy Christmas movie. We're talking about two, a combo meal, if you will, a signature two piece, <laughs> a twofer, a buy one, get one free Christmas savings. Love it. Last time we were here, we finally ended the dreadful series within a series. Finally finished the last Twilight movie, Breaking Dawn part two, truly terrible animatronic baby, pedophile Jacob, don't come for me, I said it. Terrible, I loved it. <laughs> but if you haven't checked out that video, you can check it out up above, or you can check it out in the bad movies in a beat playlist today. Like I said, very exciting. We're doing a two piece with a biscuit. Today we're doing a twofer. Never been done before in the series. We've been doing the series for over a year now. Never been done. Never been seen before. The first being the lifetime romantic drama involving Mario Lopez <laughs> playing a sexy Colonel Sanders. No, you did not hear that incorrectly. You did not hear that wrong. That is literally what it is. It's a KFC funded lifetime mini movie called Recipe for Seduction. Now this movie, like I said, is a mini movie. It's only 15 minutes. And I knew that I couldn't pass up the opportunity to talk about this on Bad Movies in a Beat. True, essentially it's just a glorified, very long advertisement. I couldn't not, <laughs> I couldn't not talk about this undoubtedly wonderful cluster of information. So I figured let's talk about two movies. Something as equally as, inconsequential and stupid and we'll just shove them both in the same video so with that said our second piping hot pile of garbage is actually going to be the 2018 horror comedy called santa jaws the the story of a santa themed shark that goes on a killing spree but yes let us begin our dive into madness starting off with a recipe for seduction now, since starting this series, I've been asked to watch some f***ing movies, like some terrible, <laughs> some awful sounding movies, just every day. Like, oh, Kendall, watch the Christian love story with Ja Rule. Oh, Kendall, watch the story about a woman who had a butthole for a mouth. <laughs> oh, Kendall, watch any movie with Noah's scent of a sh movie over and over again, but on purpose. But I am pretty sure I have never been tagged more. <laughs> Then when Lifetime teased their upcoming short film that was sponsored by KFC and was intended to be a super sexy, sexualized Colonel Sanders. Now, as stupid as this sounds, I gotta say great advertising. One, I got KFC after it. I was like, wow, y'all really got rid of the wedges? The two things that I said were okay at KFC were the honey barbecue wings and the wedges and then my change both of those things. But as far as advertising goes, it was efficient. It was effective. I did order KFC that day. <laughs> but I will say this is not a singular event of trying to sexify Colonel Sanders. Over the years, slowly turning Colonel Sanders into an unexpected sex symbol. There was Chippin Colonel, the dating sim, I love you Colonel Sanders, <laughs> which I've yet to play. But needless to say, outside of the sheer just stupid. I was truly intrigued by the concept of a 16 minute lifetime movie. And that's because I've long complained that as corny and somewhat entertaining that lifetime movies can be, they're often just so drawn out. They don't need to be an hour and a half, hun. We could have did this in a half an hour. It got right to the point. It developed a plot very, very quickly. 
and then it ended with chicken. And it was able to do all that and give us everything that we're looking for from a Lifetime movie. Lust, we got lies, we got rich people being naughty. Plots to attempt murder, all in a convenient 16 minute package with 11 herbs and spices. This piping hot love affair of deep fried romantic goodness is presented by Kentucky Fried Chicken. I fucking hate it here. <laughs> so the movie begins with a group of rich white people having rich white people Christmas dinner featuring KFC. <laughs> oh, I forgot, we gotta have the gay black friend. He's there too. It's a special occasion, not just because it's Christmas, but because there's a proposal underway. I am madly, wildly, certifiably, insanely in love with you. Maybe this is my attachment issues, but <laughs> if I was gonna say yes, <laughs> I'm not now. Now this grown ass man's name is Billy and he's proposing to his girlfriend, Jessica, who doesn't seem too keen on the idea. Almost surprised as if y'all have not discussed marriage before you propose to her. Don't recommend that. <laughs> You just setting yourself up to get clowned in a public space, my dude. Now, Jessica, following her heart and her intuition, does not say yes and instead excuses herself from the table. This has become such an anime look and it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> I don't know how we got here. So apparently, when Jessica turned down this proposal, she was actually doing more than just turning down this guy that she was dating. She was also defying her family because her mother apparently wants her to marry this guy, Billy, because he's like some rich heir of something or other. And they have some extremely large amount of debt after uh, Jessica's father passed. And so the only way to get out of that debt and not have their entire mansion and way of life foreclosed on is for her to pimp out her daughter. So obviously the daughter's not too keen on that idea, <laughs> but before she could really hone in on the dilemma at hand, she gets her first glimpses of Harland Sanders, the new cook. I am speechless. Christmas Eve luncheon is, is ready for you to look at, Mrs. Montetta. Sorry. I have tears in my eyes. <laughs> there is a connection. She has already fallen. So Jessica, feeling this connection, wanting to go with this connection, decides to shoot a little shot. She invites Sanders out to tour the property, see her beautiful mansion and to have some alone time with him. They get closer. She complains about her boyfriend or whatever he is to her now and, and he tells her how he's looking to change the world with his secret recipe billy interrupts them angry and dejected and this scene gives me one of my favorite moments in the entire situation who the hell are you harlan sanders the new chef beat it crouton don't call me crouton I still fucking hate it here. So Jessica talks with her gay black friend by nature of being the gay black friend is going to be the, the sort of sage of wisdom <laughs> to this movie. Jessica tells him that essentially she thinks she's already in love with Sanders. It's a 15 minute movie, we gotta move quickly. Tell me he has a secret recipe that's gonna change the world. I believe in him. But then she leaves and her mom uses her phone to text Billy to meet her. I don't know why she did that. And then she also took the phone and hid it. But instead of, of course, meeting up with Jessica, Billy ends up meeting up with her mom in this swanky country club that the gay black friend ended up having a date at. So he's also there, he's scoping things out. She meets up with Billy and warns him that Jessica is in love with the chicken man. <laughs> and they need to devise a plan so that they both can get her to come back to Billy and get this marriage going. Billy kind of scoffs at the idea that Jessica's in love with the fry cook, even if he has some secret recipe that he plans or thinks would change the world. But speaking of secrets, <laughs> apparently Mama Dearest and uh, Billy have been smashing for a while now. If her daughter and him get married, she'll give him all the geriatric pussy. <laughs> Peddling pussy, canoodling coochie for, for the benefit of the family. I hate the world we live in. I truly do. The gay best friend overhears this plot, even though he's like eight yards away. And then subsequently goes to tell his best friend what is up. Back at the house, Billy ends up searching far and wide for the secret recipe that Sanders seems to go on about. And he ends up finding it. Secrets out, chicken man. 
Wait, this is not a recipe. <laughs> Dude's acting like this is how you unlock Da Vinci's code. All you have is just inquiries. <laughs> too much, too little. Seven spices, nine spices. I don't know. Running into Sanders while he's there. At which point he decides to bribe Sanders that despite his secret recipe that he keeps going on about, he will never be able to be with Jessica because she's already accepted his proposal, which is a lie. Offer Sanders $500,000 to essentially get lost. Black gay friend comes to the house um, and he comes looking for Jessica. I saw you and Billy at the club. You had your hands all over him. I was merely consoling him. I know what I saw and I'm telling Jessica. But before he can convey this message to Jessica, he gets knocked out with a broom. Who somehow by herself, even though she's like a buck oh five, was able to drag him to a different room. Sanders goes to, there's a lot going on here. Sanders goes to Jessica. I'll leave you guys alone, but you don't have to buy me off, basically. Why would you tell them about my secret recipe? It's supposed to be between us. She tells him the truth, that she had never accepted Billy's proposal and that she wants to be with him. Billy, we have a problem. So the next morning, Jessica goes looking for Sanders and finds that apparently he's not here, at least according to the mom. Like, yeah, he just kind of left and he didn't really say anything about it. While on a leisurely walk, she ends up finding that they had kidnapped Harlan, but didn't take him off the premises. They just put him in like a storage room on the grounds, didn't kill him, didn't do anything to him, just tied him up because, you know, dramatic effect. Am I really sitting here trying to do plot holes into a movie about a sexualized Colonel Sanders? <laughs> Sometimes, Kendall, you really hurt your own feelings. Anyway, and the evil mother in a panic says, just to kill him, which I just asked why y'all hadn't, anyway. But before they can kill him, in an anticlimactic rush to the finish, the black guy escaped and he actually hit somebody with a broom, saving the day. This is all your fault! <laughs> they kiss. And this is Lifetime, so a year later they get married. And meanwhile, Mom and Billy are in a mental hospital. And they lead it into a Southern Fried sequel. <laughs> Truly a stupid, pointless waste of time. Loved it. It's not super Christmassy, other than the fact that it came out during Christmas season. But this next pile of garbage, and subsequently, what will be the rest of the video, I did not love. It was terrible. Despite it having such an outlandish idea, was so boring somehow. I don't know how you made such a stupid idea sound even less entertaining, but they somehow did it. 2018, Santa Jaws. One that we asked for even less than a Christmas themed KFC love story. This movie is about a child named Cody who was able to turn his monstrous shark that murders everybody but make a Christmas theme comic into a real life thing where people are actually getting eaten to death. The movie begins with a homicidal Santa preparing to kill a woman at the pier by dumping her into shark infested waters. And of course, if we weren't already aware that this is where this was gonna go, we are inundated, punched in the face with corny Christmas related punnery, just a slew of Christmas shtick. See with jingle hell. Santa is swiftly overtaken and eaten by the shark. And now this shark roams the world with the spirit of evil Santa. But hold on people. Before you get too concerned, it is not actually reality. It is but the ideas, the musings of like a 14 year old kid named Cody, who is writing a comic with this premise of something referred to as Santa Jaws. Now Cody's but a simple child. He lives in suburbia with his annoying parents. He has an older brother, a grandfather, a rich highfalutin uncle with his annoying social media girlfriend who I take offense to. Us social media people are not just blonde haired bimbos. <laughs> He has a crush on a girl in the neighborhood who just moved in, she does track. Speaking of his annoying parents, by the way, as stupid as this movie is, they really make that mom. <laughs> I actually wanted her to die first, but of course, because this movie is trash, it gives me the last thing I want. Spoiler, she'll survive most of the movie. Girl, put a lip balm on. 
Only thing drier than your lips is a sense of humor. Cody gets grounded for making a somewhat kind of funny callback to Animal Farm about the totalitarian regime of his high school principal. And his grandfather kind of breaks him out of Oz, ends up gifting him a pen, will, you know, further inspire him to continue on with his dream of being a comic book creator. Infuriated by the, the life that he has with his annoying family, particularly his annoying mom, he ferociously draws with that pen. It's magic if you didn't see that coming. So yes, they go fishing. And after a cute little pep talk, it was very nice. He's, you know, face your fears, go after what you want. Uh, grandpa immediately gets eaten by, what the f is that? So after his grandfather just got eaten by a shark, Cody's feeling some type of way. <laughs> so he runs back home and he goes to tell his family, hey, grandpa got eaten by a shark. Now, instead of being alarmed and confused by this, his parents are more so offended that he wasn't still in his room grounded and that ultimately he's making these vast delusional stories about sharks and stuff and it has nothing to do with reality. Cody, we won't engage in these fantasies. I'm not lying. You're grounded for another week. I can't believe you would do this on Christmas Eve. Which I find fascinating. If you really thought that your kid is like losing his mind to the extent that he made up a whole story about his grandfather being eaten by a shark, he might have something actually wrong. If you truly believe with all your heart of hearts, that that's what's going on here. Y'all are bad parents <laughs> and they don't think to look in on granddad at all. I just really want the mom in particular to get that shark smoke. I want her to get all the smoke. She deserves it, chomp chomp. Realizing that no one would believe him and he's all alone, he decides to not call like animal control or the authorities or anything. He decides to gather help from the other nerds at the comic book shop. They go, they also don't really believe him, but he's like, my comic book came to life and that shark is roaming around free. Now I probably should have worn this way earlier in the video, but this movie is so boring <laughs> that there are parts that I might like logistically get things wrong just simply because it was so hard to keep my attention. I've never had such a hard time focusing on a movie before in my life and I've seen some fucking movies. <laughs> Somehow the comic had gotten to the comic book shop and was no longer in Cody's possession. So the comic book people had allowed someone to borrow the book. Apparently it's the girl that Cody has a crush on. So Cody goes with his best friend to talk to the girl about the comic book and to get it back. But she's like, yeah, I don't have the book here. I actually left it on my dad's boat or something. So yeah, let's all go up there. And eventually it ends up becoming this like ragtag team that tries to kill the shark. So the uncle and his girlfriend end up going up to his yacht because he has a yacht. That's how you know he's rich. She's being her social media stereotype self. She's in bikinis and it got me really questioning, what is the weather? Like what, where are they? What state is this? <laughs> She's wearing a bikini, but in other scenes, other people are wearing like sweaters and fall and winter appropriate clothing, but they're also on a port. Give it me Maryland, but I know it would be cold as hell in Maryland. Anywho, the uncle gets eaten by the shark and social media girl goes back to the family and she's like, hey, shark, oh my God. And for some reason, they still don't believe <laughs> that there's a shark about. Okay, say you you just saying, I don't trust my kid. He's stupid, he's crazy. I'm a bad parent. I don't think to look into his mental illnesses if I believe that they are there. Anyway, this whole ass grown woman is sitting here like, there's a shark and my boyfriend and your brother just got eaten by it. And they're still like, oh, you. Now, despite not trusting or believing that the uncle was eaten by a shark, they do go out and look for him, the parents. That's when they see the shark for the first time and only then do they believe, oh my God, there's a shark running about, swimming about about garner weapons, guns, <laughs> to take down the shark. Let's put this fish on ice. They at least called the police at some point, way too late. And they too have this weird like dubiousness. Ain't no sharks around here, click. Maybe they just do. <laughs> These around here useless. Now, the ragtag team, they're trying to find weapons. So they go to the comic book store as opposed to going to authorities who would have weapons or whatever trap materials would be needed to get this animal. But nope, we're gonna go medieval and get like crossbows that are at the comic book shop for some reason. <laughs> and they take all these super medieval weapons and go to attack the shark themselves because that is the most reasonable way to go about this. 
and they end up hitting it with like a crossbow. They realize that these weapons, the crossbow, the harpoon, whatever, aren't really doing a good job to take the shark down. And in finding that out, it's too late. The, the social media girl ends up being our next kill but she was able to hurt it by stabbing it with a candy cane. Realized that, oh, the thing to actually hurt it is to use Christmas themed weaponry. <laughs> they make a bomb out of tree ornaments. They make like a harpoon out of a candy cane because apparently those are the weaknesses of the shark, which feels weird that the creator of the shark, Cody, wouldn't have known that from Jump. We have another casualty. The best friend gets eaten, he was annoying anyway. Desperate to bring an end to the carnage, they realize, hey, the only way that we can stop this is that we need to use the power of the pen. Wait, didn't they just say they needed Christmas stuff to kill it? Well, I guess that wasn't strong enough. We also need the power of the pen, I don't know. And at some point they realize that they had left the pen at the comic book shop. So they go back to the comic book shop and the comic book guy doesn't wanna give them the pen because he realized its power. He, he conjured up a Russian girlfriend and a sports car. And when the kids come for the pen, he swiftly denies it to them. People are gonna die if you do not give me- I don't care! Well, if only anti-maskers were only so honest and forthright. The girl tackles him, gets the pen, and is able to give it back to Cody, but they are both swiftly eaten by the shark. Ain't nobody making it out alive out of this one, sis. Cody draws a candy cane to impale the shark, only for that to turn into a horn. <laughs> They finally team up with the parents, make up for all their transgressions and misunderstandings, but then they swiftly start fighting again because they don't believe that Cody created this thing with his magic pen and his comic book. But anyway, they still team up and they decide to uh, fill a bunch of turkeys with gunpowder and we're going to shoot it once the shark uh, goes up to it and they only make this Christmas themed by just saying the 12 days of Christmas while putting gunpowder <laughs> in each bird. Three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. Ah, ha, 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 ha. But before that plan can really work, the brother dies. The dad jumps in after him and then dies because what else did he expect to happen from that? And they still, for some reason, have yet to take the annoying ass mama out. Cody shoots the shark as it goes for the turkey. It explodes. Mom keeps being a bitch and ends up like arguing with him over the brother and not the pen is... <laughs> Why is she arguing about reality at this point? This pin is meaningless, but in an effort to make up with her son, she goes to get it and she finally, she finally gets nom nom done. And it was very cathartic because this movie is trash, but that was the only thing I was looking forward to. But in the midst of her being chewed on like some big league chew, Cody realizes that he can write in his comic book that he wants his family back and that he wants this to all be over. And just like that, everyone is alive again and all is back to normal. He burns the comic in his backyard, considers throwing in his pen as well, but with a knowing smirk, he decides to keep it. And that, my friends, is the end of the movie. So there you have it. Merry Christmas. Here's a pile of shit. Before I, before I leave, I do want to say that um, I've had a lot of people say that the channel, particularly the series, has been quite a kind of a saving grace for a lot of people in the sense that it's something to just take your mind off of all of the BS that's going on. I want to vocalize that that is not a one-way street. That is just, that is me too. I've been enjoying doing this and interacting with you guys. You guys keep me so grounded and just sane. And I, I just really want to thank you. And this has been an incredible year, incredible in so many ways, so many negative, so many positive ways as well. And I just want to thank you all for coming along for the ride and more rides to go on, hopefully less traumatic and awful. And thanks a bunch. I really appreciate it, guys. You guys are amazing. So with that said, if you like this video, be sure to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD, and I will see you guys next time.